Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to another journey through Exodus. We are having, I believe, such a great study and an opportunity to understand who our God really is. And I am so impacted by last week's message and the fact that as God rained down bread, Jesus declared, I am the bread from heaven. And so we want to keep this perspective throughout our study today as well. It's an important piece of our study. And so um, a couple things to remind us of just these, these things that God has done to demonstrate his power and that he is, in fact, as he states, the Lord their God and the Lord our God. And so in this thing, we've seen the Red Sea victory, this miraculous way in which God provided redemption out of Egypt, this picture where there was no escape, there was no way, but God made a way. And what a cool and powerful moment. Then we also saw last week this, this area where the Israelites traveled to Mara. It was water that was bitter and undrinkable, and, and God provided and made this way in which Moses throws a log in and it makes the water drinkable and the people could quench their thirst. And then, of course, we re- referenced this already, the, the bread from heaven would, would fall down and allow them to have bread in the day and also meat would come in night and quail and, and so forth. And God continues to be the provider, as we talked about last week. But I don't know if you've noticed, there's a pattern that has formed. And keep watching, keep reading, and keep studying, and what you'll see is this. I'm seeing a pattern. The Israelites cry for help. Then God responds. He sends something or someone, and then the Israelites grumble, and God provides. This continual pattern back and forth of of the Israelites ultimately wondering, who is God? Who are you? And so I want to kind of kick off today's from where we left off, this this picture that bread is falling, and God is going to implement a beautiful thing for them in our story today. So I want to ask this question Um, when is the last time that you intentionally rested? When's the last time you intentionally rested? Have you ever looked at your kid or some kid in the store and said, man, that kid needs a nap? Like it's clear they are exhausted. Or has anybody ever come to you and said, what's your problem? I think you need a nap. Have you ever looked at yourself and just asked the question, what's going on here? Why am I so distracted or distressed? Why am I so anxious or nervous? What is, what's this fear in me? Why can't I rest? And so God today, we're going to find out, has something for us that is so beautiful, but has been twisted to be so manipulative and, and so guilt-producing that is not what God wanted And so when's the last time you intentionally rested? And and what I want you to hear in our story today is God is guiding his people, the Israelites. And what he did is he, he removed them out of Egypt. He helped them to escape. And so one of the things that Egypt is a picture of is a picture of the world in the Bible. It's, it's, a, it's a reference, a, an image of what the world has for us, where we become slaves to the world. The world offers us all kinds of things that look good on the outside, but we find our our emptiness and we find ourselves thirsty and hungry. And God is providing these spiritual needs for us. And I I thought about it this way. I've heard other pastors refer to this, that God is taking the Israelites through a journey to help, one, get them out of Egypt, and then, two, to get Egypt out of them that they have learned to live under the power and control of the Egyptian culture or the world. And the same is true for you and I, that God, not only did he desire, but through Christ, he brought us salvation. He brought us a deliverance out of the world. And for you and I as well, he desires to get the world out of us so we look more like him. So we're going to pick up where we left off in Exodus chapter 16 in verse 22. I really encourage you to follow along, make some notes and circle. But let's continue in our journey and remind ourselves what happened in 21, that they were already told to gather this bread, to gather it in the morning. But at the end of the day, as the hot sun would come, it would melt away the bread and new bread would come tomorrow. So verse 22 says it this way, On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, 
two omers each. This was a command that God gave them. He said, look, for six days you're going to gather bread. It'll fall every day for you. It will melt away as the sun rises. And then on the sixth day, however, you're going to grab double portions, enough to carry you through. And so it says, continuing on, and when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil, and all that is left over lay aside to be kept till morning. So they've gathered their bread. They come to Moses, say, hey, look, we did it. And he's like, remember, you make sure you can boil it, you can prepare it, and leave some over for next the next day. Well, this is a little bit of a challenge because if you remember last week, some people did that, but not, on, not for the Sabbath. They just kept stuff overnight and the morning it would be rotten. It would it'd stank, as the scriptures said, and it would be full of worms. And so now there's the challenge. Wait a minute. First you say, only gather for the day, but now you're telling us on the sixth day, gather enough for two wow, God, are you really going to provide? Are you really going to give us what we need desperately? Are you going to fulfill our hunger? And so this this is what has been said to do this. In verse 24, it says, So they laid it aside until morning as Moses commanded them, and it did not stink, and there were no worms in it. What a miracle. They actually, first of all, the miracle one, they actually obeyed Moses' commands. Like instead of, you know, scrambling around, they said, okay, all right, I guess we'll give it a try. And they woke up and sure enough, as God had spoken through Moses, it did not stink and it did not have worms. And then verse 25 says, Moses said, eat it today for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. God is so crafting a moment here, an opportunity. He says, look, for six days you're going to work. And the same is true for you and me. We're called to work. We do have this need in us and also this this necessity that we must work to pay bills, to take care of our families, to to buy the things that we need to survive. We understand that. But he says, I'm going to do something special though. I'm going to give you enough so that you can actually rest. That word Sabbath comes up, and a lot of people are struggle with the word Sabbath. In fact, there's a lot of misconceptions. The first misconception is that Sabbath means Saturday. And some people actually create their religious systems around that. Well, the word Sabbath, it just means literally to cease, to stop, to reflect. It's, it's this moment that says, take all the stuff that you've been doing and don't do it. Just take a break to Sabbath. And so God is telling them in verse 26, look, I'm going to provide for you. Remember last week, I'm your provider. Remember? I'm going to provide for you. You're going to gather so that on the seventh day, you can stop and you can rest from all your work and all your labor. Verse 27, it says, on the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather. Ah. They did so well. They, they carried over the, the, the bread and, and they had it ready to go. And on that next day, some of them, they got up and they went out and gathered. And it says, but they found none. Why are they surprised when God says, look, it's not going to be there. I've provided for you. Why are they surprised? And, and I, I know this is one of those moments where you and I, we can look at the Israelites and we can say, how foolish are you? Don't you get it? Like he said it would be good and then it was and that you still went out. But remember, he's getting Egypt out of them. We talked a lot last time about they have a rose-colored glasses as they look back on their life in Egypt or their life in the world of all the provision they had. And they sat around and ate pots of meat. And I have a tough time believing that those who were in slavery had pots of meat abound. My guess is that, yeah, they had food and there may have been some times where there was ample food. But I think that what they're reminiscing on is probably a lie. They're telling themselves it was so good And they're questioning, can I really trust God? Can I really trust you? Look at verse 28. Then the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and the laws? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on six 
days, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of this place on the seventh day. And finally, verse 30, it says, and so the people rested on the seventh day. God is saying, I need you to understand. I am not just your provider. I have something that I desperately want to do with you and for you because I know your needs. I know your needs. So rest. Verse 31, now the house of Israel called its name manna. It was like coriander seed, white, and tasted of it like wafers made with honey. I like honey. That would be pretty sweet. But I question Wow, this is quite a a miracle food. It it tastes good. They collect it fresh daily. Moses in verse 32 said, This is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer of it be kept throughout your generations so that they may see the bread which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, Take a jar and put an omer of manna in it and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the testimony to be kept. The people of Israel ate manna 40 years till they came to the habitable land. They ate the manna till they came to the border of the land of Canaan. And Omer is a tenth of a part of an ephah. There's this picture of, there's a, there's a measurement tool. That's kind of that last reference in there. They're to keep this, this Omer, this, this gallon-sized collection of the bread. And, and God would, in his beautiful power would sustain that so they would remember it. It wasn't for them to eat. It was just a memorial to say, don't forget God provided for you, that God is is the one who's in control. And I marvel at this. It says that they ate the manna for 40 years. Have you ever ate something day after day? I love pizza and and I kind of feel like as much as I love pizza, if it was the exact same pizza day after day after day, I might get kind of sick of that. But it doesn't say that they got sick of it. It makes me think that God in his, his mercy and his graciousness gave them something that each day, not only would it be filling for them, but it would be good to eat. It'd be tasty for them. And I also notice it says they ate it for 40 years till they came to this habitable, habitable land. In other words, They're on the journey to the promised land. And and Jesus, remember last week, referred to himself as the bread that came from heaven. And and we are called and challenged to to pursue him and to feast on his word, to feast on the truth of who Jesus is, this bread from heaven. And, And that you and I too should daily feed upon it for as many years as he gives us here until someday we reach that eternal promised land of heaven. And he provided Jesus so that we could be filled. But today, I want to focus now on this idea of Sabbath. And the point I want to pull out of our text is that God is our rest. God is our rest. You see, God in Genesis declared in his word, it says that he created for six days. He spoke everything into existence. But then it says that on the seventh day, He rested. He modeled for us what we desperately need. See, some people go, well, why did he take a break? Was he exhausted? Well, let's see, he's all powerful. So you can't drain God of energy. He didn't need to stop. He could have kept uh, figuring out all kinds of new creations. He could spoke creation until even today. He could keep creating new ideas. You and I would run out of ideas ultimately, but not our God. But it says that he rested. And I love that often in, the, in Genesis, the account is that he looked on it and it was good. And then he looked at his creation of, of you and me, of humanity, and he says it was very good. But see, he rested. He modeled it for us. And I think one of the challenges of the Sabbath for the Israelites and for you and I today is the perspective at which we approach it. Approach it. How do we see the Sabbath? I want to make the case today that God's heart and desire was simply this, to give us rest so we could be in relationship with him. And I think that's all he intended. He just says, look, your body was not made to go seven days in a row or 14 days in a row or 30 days in a row or 365 days in a row. Your body requires rest and so does your spirit. Your spirit needs to rest in me. 
And so we're at this moment where God tells the Israelites, look, you're going to need to stop. Look at uh, this verse back to 29. I thought this was pretty powerful. He says, see, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. He's giving you rest. He's given you the ability to stop. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remember, he's going to provide everything you need so that you can rest. And then it says, remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. Can you imagine? Just let's get back into the the family for a moment, into Israelite family, three million or so people walking through the desert day after day, picking up camp and setting camp down, setting it up, getting ready, collecting the bread and the manna in the morning, collecting the meat at night and cooking. All of that energy that's going on, imagine the exhaustion that they were feeling. Your kids are whiny, your body is exhausted, your animals are tired, and God says, I know what you need, and I'm going to provide everything you need so that you can rest in me and with me. See, I'm a God of relationship. And unfortunately, I think that you and I and the Israelites, of ultimately the Jewish culture, took what was supposed to be a special, just, just be with me. Let me provide for you and, and be with me. And they turned it into this religious duty, creating so many rules to make sure that they kept it holy. They couldn't do things like help a dying animal, push an elevator button today. These are all these regulations. And they're began to lose the heart and focus of what it was for. You see, God is our rest. And I want to just draw out four key ideas that I've seen throughout this passage and throughout our our study. But I think it's important for you and I to understand why do we need this rest? Why does God care so much about us that he says, I'll provide for you if only you will rest? The first thing I want to pull out is this idea that He gives us the gift of emotional rest. Because He is our rest, He gives us the gift of emotional rest. Emotional rest. Think about our our Israelites. They were grumbling. That's a pretty good sign. They've got some attitude issues. Their emotions are high. They're, They're anxious. They're confused. They're unsure Will there'll be bread tomorrow. See, their emotions are strung out. And God says, look, I'm going to provide everything for you so that tomorrow you don't have to worry. You can allow yourself to settle. That grumbling can be cared for as you see that there's food available, as you see that my provision will last and satisfy you. You don't have to worry about what is going to be provided tomorrow. I'm going to take care of it. You can have emotional rest. Second thing I see is that he gives the gift of physical rest. Physical rest. He says, yeah, you're still going to need to work. But on that day before the Sabbath, on that sixth day, you're going to collect double portions so that you don't have to work at all. Your animals can rest. Your family can rest. Your kids who are exhausted from traveling, they can rest. God is our rest. You don't have to worry. You don't have to pick up food tomorrow. You don't have to to go through the the process of, of laboring to produce the bread, to cook the meat. We're going to take care of that on day six, and you're just going to rest, and your body is going to be rejuvenated. Third, he says this. He says, I'm going to give you the gift of mental rest. What a cool gift. Imagine how exhausted they are mentally every day, concerned. Will there be bread tomorrow? Where are we going to travel tomorrow? Is the water going to be bitter again? Will we have something to drink? See, God continues to provide their food, their water, and here he's talking about rest for their mental rest. No more do they have to worry about what's for dinner tomorrow. Or some of you know the history. They don't have to ask the question, where's the beef? They can rest. They don't have to make that a big concern. God says it's going to be all taken care of on the sixth day. You can just rest. You can relate to one another. You can rejuvenate and replenish and be filled by me in relationship with me. And of course, the biggest and most poignant part, all of this is pointing to, is that he gives us spiritual rest. 
He gives the Israelites spiritual rest. He says, remember, I am your redeemer. I'm the one who brought you out of Egypt. For you and I, remember, I'm your redeemer. Through Christ, I brought you out of the world. I gave you healing. I gave you life. He says repeatedly to the Israelites, I am the Lord your God. Remember that. Be filled and encouraged in your spirit. He says, I'm with you. I've surrounded you. Remember the cloud that that came around you. Remember that that I showed up to you in the cloud. He says, I'm in control. Remember, I'm the one who's, who's almighty. I'm the one who's in control of all of this. If only you would rest your spiritual rest in me and trust in me, you can trust that I will lead you where I'm promised I would take you. Ultimately, it's a deep soul rest. And I think our God is so wise that he says, look, I know something about you. You need your emotions to settle and your physical body to rest and your mind to to settle down and quit worrying so that you and I can commune and I can fill your spirit. Because we have lots of distractions. Have you ever tried to rest with your phone on? Have you ever tried to to rest and enjoy a relationship with your family while you're constantly looking up the next stat on whatever it is, on whatever social media network you choose to use or trying to send a picture of your meal to somebody else the whole time your family's right there and they're just saying, can we just be together? How's your rest? You see, God desires healthy disciples. And healthy disciples are developed in rest. In fact, if you want to be a healthy disciple, I will tell you, you must learn to rest. And so the question I know you're wrestling with, you're you're hearing me talk about, there was a law presented. This was a covenant law given to the Israelites. In fact, when you read through Exodus, you'll find out that God takes this rest very seriously. He even tells them, like, we're going to put some statutes in where, where people will die if they don't observe this. And so you're asking the question, do I have to? Which, first of all, is a revealing question because you're, you're trying to figure out, what do I have to do? What do I not have to do? And Jesus, he took care of everything. Remember on the cross when, when he was hanging there, the last words he said, he, he says, it is finished. You see, everything that the, the Sabbath, the manna, Everything that you've done, your deliverance was pointing to me. And you need to come to me for rest. So the first question is, do I have to? Well, if you want eternal rest in Christ, then yes, you must surrender your life to him for that rest and call him Lord. You must. It's the only way you'll have eternal rest forever in heaven with him is just to surrender But the question I really hear is, do I have to? And let me give you some thoughts on this. I was trying to synthesize a few things, and I came up with a statement. It says, God's gift, the Sabbath, is God's gift and invitation to rest in Him. It's an opportunity. Would you have relationship with me? Two, in this rest, He desires for me to remember His provision in my life and acknowledge the finished work on the cross where God made a way into eternal rest in Jesus Christ. The whole point was, would you set time aside just to gather and get to know me, to spend time with me, to spend quality time and quantity? Would you weekly build up quantity time? I want to be with you so that the quality can happen. Would you spend time with me? And as you do, Remember that I'm the one who gives you rest. Remember that I'm the one who provides. Remember that Christ came. I love this this, uh, from Matthew 11. Jesus says this way, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You do not have to work to please me. I took care of it. If you would come to me, I will give you rest. Rest that you can enjoy one day a week in the fullness of it. And then that same rest carries me through the week. When when I begin to worry, I can just rest. Jesus, you're in control. You are the provider. This powerful moment, will you come to me? Will you surrender your life to me? Will you let me be your Lord? And if you will, I will give you eternal rest with me as a promise, a guarantee, but I will also give you daily rest moment by moment because I will be with you. 
See, God implemented with the Israelites a day of rest and he provided. So the question is, when's the last time you intentionally rested? I want to close with a few kind of thoughts here just to, to unpack this. There's a reality of our need. And so when I hear people ask the question, do I have to, to be honest, I would say that many of you, uh, yeah, you do. <laughs> Not to earn your way to heaven. That's been done by Jesus, but, but many of you need to learn to rest. We're not good at it because we, we get in, caught in the whirlwind, think, whirlwind and we think, I have to work hard. I, if I can't work on Sunday or Saturday or whatever day you pick, if I can't work, I'll never get ahead. I'll never get here. I'll never accomplish this. My goals, my dreams. I, and then you find yourself exhausted. Real quick, I had a, a few thoughts. I, there's, there's ways in which people view the Sabbath. Here's a few just that are out there. A couple one is there's people who mock it. They look at you and me as followers of Christ and they say, you guys are foolish. You'll never get ahead. They're right. They say, you'll never get ahead. You're going to be behind in your payments. There's no way you're going to get up the ladder of success. And they would call us fools for resting. Same was true in the culture of the Israelites. Nobody rested back then. And they were coming out of 400 years of slavery. They never had a vacation. They don't know how to do it. Remember, God's getting the world out of them. He's getting Egypt out of them. The pattern that they lived under, he said, that is not sustainable. Healthy disciples rest. So there are those that mock it. There's those that hate it. I can't do that. I don't have time for it. There's those that ignore it. I don't need it. I mean, good grief, I'm in my 30s. I don't sleep. You keep talking about taking naps. If you, that's all you've heard, you've missed it. <laughs> Go back and start over. You missed the point. It's, yes, sleeping is important, but we're talking about a deep spiritual need for soul rest where you can rest. So some people ignore it. Some people try it when it's convenient. That sounds really good. I should probably do that. When my schedule opens up, God, I'll, I'll create a little margin of, of time with you. Or they'll do the same thing in giving. They'll say, you know, when I have enough, when the bank account is full enough, then I'll, then I'll, I'll give you some of that money you blessed me with. And God's saying, that's not how it works. If you just trust me, I'll provide so don't just try it when it's convenient. Put it into practice. And so there are those who worship it, and you think, that's, that's me, but hold on. There are those that worship the day, not the reason for the day. Remember the Sabbath, Jesus said. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So people begin to worship the day, and they put rules and restrictions on that day to themselves and others. And they say, it has to be this day, and it has to be this way but then there are those who truly rest and they learn the value of taking one day a week, setting aside the phone, putting aside the work requirements, taking a break from the labor so that you can spend time with family, the community of God and with God himself so that he can rest you physically and rest your emotional state and rest your mind so that he can fill you with his spirit and you can be transformed the way he wants. I want to close here in Colossians. I think uh, the Apostle Paul makes a, an important point to why the Sabbath can be so dangerous. Look what he says, Colossians 2. He says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink or with regard to festival or new moon or Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to, gum, to come, but the substance belongs to to Christ. In other words, he says, don't get yourself in such a pattern that you lose the heart. I wanted relationship with you and I want you to rest because I know it's best for you. And this is it. People want to tell you it has to be this day or it has to be that way. And that's what we call religion. The essence of religion is do these things to please God. And Jesus said, it's finished. He's pleased with you if you're resting in me, if I'm your Lord and Savior. So do you view Sabbath as religion of a list of things to do, of days and ways, or are you starting to realize this is a relationship, an invitation into being healthy, to have a, a healthy spiritual walk with the Lord? When I was uh, building a house years ago, it was over 20-some years ago, we were building a house in Oakland, and, and 
Not only was I teaching at the time full-time, I was working for the state of Oregon, I was working with a university, and I decided I have some skills, so I'll also be a big part of building the house. So I have to do the roofing, all the finish work inside, all the painting. I mean, there's a list, all the floors, all the cabinets, all the counters. That's what I was going to take on. And I remember my wife Jennifer and I, we just said, how are we going to do this? How are we going to finish all of this work? And I said, let's, let's take a break on Sunday. Let's, let's honor God with this day and let's spend time with a family and the time with him. So we would come together. I had two boys, young boys at the time. We'd come together and we'd worship at church and visit with some friends. And, then, and every Sunday we'd go look at the progress of the house. We'd marvel at how fast it's moving. And there's this and there's that. And, and then we might do a small little project as a family, like, I don't know, pick up the little spacers and the tile. And then that's it. We're not gonna, we're not gonna get all the tools out. We're not gonna get to work. We're gonna rest. And you know what happened is we grew together as a family. We reached a point where the contractor came to me and apologized, and he said, "Um, I'm sorry, I'm slowing you down. It looks like you're getting ahead of me. And we actually finished the house early. And in that process, I realized an important principle that that God provided. And, And as I rested, I actually had more strength to get through the week. As I rested, I became more familiar with who he is and his plan for my life. As I rested, my family dynamic deepened, the the relationship together deepened. And I hope that you'll take to heart this idea that, that you do not have to Sabbath. You don't have to do this to earn your way to heaven. Jesus says, just come to me and I'll give you that rest. For eternity and today, I will give you that rest. But I I want you to really evaluate and say, why wouldn't you though? Why wouldn't you set aside a day to spend with the God who provides everything for you? Why wouldn't you spend time as a family? Why wouldn't you set aside things so that you could be fully devoted to one another and and take a good nap and rest and put away the phone and put away the the laptop, set all the the lumber down or whatever your work is. Just, Just give it a break. And I believe that God will bless you as he has me. Love you guys. I'm going to release to the campuses. We'll see you soon. Well, you're home and you're watching and you're probably evaluating saying, well, I, I do struggle to rest. Or maybe you're saying, I've been resting a lot. I don't know where you're at because I think this is an important time for you who are watching to, to evaluate this. And here's, here's what I want to throw at you for a question today. It says, where do you struggle implementing Sabbath rhythm, rhythms in your life? Where do you struggle with that? So just a couple practical ways to think about this. You might be watching this today or listening to it in route to work, and that's good. It's good to be filled with God's Word and be challenged by it, but maybe you're not really setting a day aside. I want to challenge you to pick a day and see what God would do as you choose a day And begin to rest in him, to celebrate him, to gather with believers, to gather with family. Second thing I would throw at you is Sabbathing requires preparation. God told the Israelites, hey, on the sixth day, gather double portions so tomorrow you can rest. So so I want to encourage you to think about what meals could you prepare in advance so you can rest on your Sabbath day? What meals maybe, what what project maybe you might work an extra hour on so that you can rest? What, what can you do to free your mind up so you can find that rest? And, and the last thing I would just say is, in your process of evaluating how to implement Sabbath rhythms, I want to just caution you to resist the temptation to turn it into a religious duty. It can be so challenging that we can walk out of the day and say, look how well I did. I'm going to do it exactly the same next week, exactly the same the next week, and I'm going to prove to God how much I love him. If you're in Christ today, I just want you to know that that Jesus loves you. And God, he's pleased with you already. But he's also desiring to be in relationship with you. He wants to speak life into you. And he wants to provide rest for you. Thanks for joining us this week. I hope you'll take this challenge. Begin to figure out how to live a life of, of Sabbath rest so that you can be a healthy disciple who makes disciples. Let me pray for you. Father God, we thank you for today. Thank you for your word that challenges my heart and gives me pause to reflect on how all the times that you provide and I have rested and you have come through 
The next day came the manna was available that you provided not only deep physical, emotional, and spiritual rest, but you filled my spirit, God. Thank you for who you are, for your mercy and your grace. Thank you that we can look to you as a God of rest. In your name we pray. Amen.